ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Project Egg Show. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with a professional Amazon seller and serial entrepreneur by the name of Quinn Amorum. How are you doing today, Quinn? Very good, Ben. How are you? I'm fantastic, and I'm very appreciative of your time today. It is an honor to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be on the show. So, Quinn, let's jump right in. What is your story? All right. So, I, I am Canadian. I was born in Canada, and I moved to Europe at the age of five, and I stayed there 25 years. And while living in Europe uh, is pretty much where I started my my hobby, which at the time, that's all it was, uh, selling online in 1997. I uh, started with eBay, which was completely unknown to me and to most of the world at the time in 97. And it was uh, not really because I was a big entrepreneur or anything, but I wanted to make extra money to go party. And so I, that's what I did. I, you know, I gathered stuff from around the house. I started selling, selling it on eBay. A lot of the stuff wasn't even mine. It was like, you know, the parents stuff, my sister's stuff. <laughs> and I would just put it there for sale. But uh, the, the thing that took off the most was actually something that today is very, very well known what I did, but at the time was completely, I don't know, insane. So I, I walked into this store just to have a look at it and it was full of wooden statues. And these wooden statues were like so cool, but so expensive at the same time. And I couldn't really afford them, but I figured hey, that there's a market out this for this out there that would would love to buy this if they had the opportunity and these people probably have the money for it so there was no smartphones but i had a, a, um, a camera at home and the next day i went there with camera i took pictures of those statues and i started selling them or i mean listing them on ebay for sale and now it's called I guess it's a weird shape of drop shipping, right? But at the time there was no name for it. Plus what I was doing, I named it selling the picture because I only had a picture and I was selling them, selling these pictures on eBay, right? And I was selling in the USA. So all the way from Portugal, that's where I was in Europe. And I was selling in the USA. And that's what took off somewhat because I could never really grow that business. Every single statue was handmade. They were carved by hand. So they were unique, one of a kind. And when somebody bought one, I would go to the store, try to buy it, and then ship it. And a lot of times I would get to the store and it was no longer there. It had been sold. So I couldn't scale it. I got, um, at the time, feedback didn't really matter too much. and eBay didn't even own PayPal. So it was, things took very long time. Shipping was not overnight. It was, you know, but I stick, I stuck with it and kept, kept changing up th to things that I knew I could scale. And then all the way to jumping back to, or yeah, back to 2015, I started doing that with Amazon, but with my own brands and, Basically, that's all I do now. I, I gave up in 2016, I believe, December. I gave up eBay completely. After all those years, it was 20, 19 years later, I gave up eBay. And now it's um, Amazon and Shopify, of course, with my own funnels and stuff like that. Let's talk about your childhood a little bit. What sort of family were you raised in? Well, we were, were a very close family, right? There was, um, it was, I guess, I, I would like to say normal, but uh, depends who's listening. It's not normal to, to everybody, right? So we were raised to Catholic, although I never really followed 
uh, as a kid, I never cared for, for anything. Uh, we would have dinner every day together. So that kind of family, no swearing, no cursing, not allowed to smoke, although I did. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, school was very important for my parents. So I kind of did it. I uh, say kind of because I never I never, never ended up going to university. I was studying accounting at the time, but I never went to university. It just I really couldn't stand it anymore. So, yeah, but it was it was really good. No fighting. No, really, never saw the parents fight. Unfortunately, um, that's why uh, I, I actually canceled the interview. The last time was as um, a couple of weeks ago. My dad died, and so I went there um, to his funeral. But uh, yeah, like I said, they were like. Perfect, perfect family, no fighting whatsoever. Well, I'm um, very sorry to hear about your father uh, and, you know, best wishes and, and all the love possible to, to your family. Um, Thank you. When, when you would be at home and y'all had dinner every single night, what were some of the things that y'all would discuss? What were those, those values that were really uh, promoted at the dinner table? All right, so uh, my mom had always been, although I didn't know, I didn't know that, but she had always been an entrepreneur. I, and not that I didn't know because she had several stores, several businesses, um, and she ran them all um, almost by herself. And I just, I just didn't care too much. I, I didn't follow, you know what I mean? So she was an entrepreneur for, you know, since, since I was born, when I was born, they already had a business in Canada, uh, both of them. And I just, maybe, maybe that's where it came from. I, but at the time I had, I had no clue. So uh, mom would talk about her businesses and my dad, he had uh, vineyards and he made wine and he sold wine and, uh, and I guess the, we still have the vineyard still steer, still there. Just there's nobody to make the wine now. Um, but it basically would be around that. Uh, you know, they would always be very interested in what I was doing in school. And then as, uh, as I start growing older, I started, you know, my teenage years in my twenties, I, I started buying motorcycles. I always loved motorcycles. So I had a few of them. Uh, and my parents were very scared of that. I had at the time a couple uh, GSX RS 1100s, what at the time were the biggest thing there was, and they were called the killer bike. And so anyway, they were always super worried about me. They worried that I would get into drugs. They worried that I would kill myself with the motorcycles and so it would kind of go the conversations would be around that like uh, what are you doing and that guy saw you drive by you're doing like 200 km an hour you should slow down that kind of stuff as as a participant in that family and um and and also did you have any or do you have any siblings Yes, I have one sister that's two years older than me. So you're the youngest in the family. Me too. Yeah. But um, as as a participant in, in that family life, and, and it seemed like y'all are very close, how did that shape your identity? Well, to be completely honest, it it shaped me only – up into a certain age because not just me, but I think majority of people, what shapes you the most is actually the people you hang out with when you're out partying. And the majority of my time after I became, I don't know, 16, 17, 17. Um, and, and from there on, the majority of my time was spent with my, my best buddies. And we were, we would hang out every single evening and night and life in Europe is a bit different. So 
we would party every single day. And no matter if it was school day or work day, if I had to start work at eight o'clock, I only had to be home by six in the morning. So, you know, I could shower and be kind of presentable to work. Uh, so it was, and I could do it because I was young. So that's what shaped me the most, the people I hung out with the most. And luckily, uh, all my friends were, were decent decent people. We did a lot of, lot of crazy stuff, but, uh, you know, not really to harm others. We would just harm ourselves with uh, abusive drinking and partying and too much uh, long, light, long nights. That's pretty much what it been. Can you maybe share with us some of those stories of, of those times out partying and having a good time? Well, uh, you know, every single night pretty much was a story. We would have, uh, we would have lots, lots of fun, but um, a lot of scary things. That, I mean, looking at it now, uh, it was scary. For, for example, speed limits are, Europe has speed limits, but it is not as enforced, I guess, like here in Canada. So, for example, uh, one of my motorcycles, it um, it would this put on there would go all the way to 320, and often we would go we would do that right. So uh, we would do that anywhere, and we would actually do racing on the streets, which right now I, I think is completely insane. It was uh, a completely a complete idiot to do so, right? But I thought it was super cool at the time and so many times that we could have, uh, we were in danger and, and worse than that, we could have actually endangered somebody else. But we would, we would not stop uh, to the police. We had, uh, we had swivels on our license plates. So if they were moving, the license plate would flip up and they were not visible behind us. And if we stopped, they would fall down and then they were visible. And a lot of stunting. Uh, every time I could, I was driving with only the rear wheel on the ground. Uh, you know, I did have a, a few crashes, but luckily I didn't break any bones. I'm still here and I didn't hurt anybody else. So, you know, I, I'm not proud of it now. By the time I was, I was, I was king of the world. Why were you so attracted to motorcycles? I don't know, Ben. I think it had to do just with who you hang out with. And we all, we all were bikers. We would go everywhere uh, on motorcycles. Most of us drove Japanese motorcycles. And then at the time, a lot of Ducati start coming out, which are beautiful bikes. And I, I guess in the 90s and so, and they were super, super beautiful. But we always made fun of them just because... To be completely honest, because they were very expensive and we couldn't really afford them. So we can't afford it, you just make fun of them, right? But, uh, I guess I always had like a huge passion for motorcycles. I, right now, I don't have one here in Canada. I still have one in Europe, which is very, very rare. And it is an Italian. And I just, I'm just leaving it there. I only drove it once and it's sitting there because it's that rare and I want to have that memory. Uh, but the passion kind of went away when I had my own kids, right? Because I don't want them to, I don't want them to do the things that I was doing. So I gave it up and I, I don't really care. Maybe right now a uh, chopper would be something more my style, but no more crazy stuff. So it seems like, you had this awesome childhood. You had a lot of fun, great family life. And then when you went into uh, university, I believe you said you were studying accounting. Maybe you can take us through your mindset of um, going to university and, and really talk about what happened there. Yeah, so I didn't go to university. I studied accounting and economics, and this is in college. I never made it to university. It was a 
don't know what it would be really called in English. It was a, um, they would speed it up. So in two years, you would get the same degree that going to university in four years. But instead of having like a couple hours of uh, math, because every single course was math, you know, financial calculation, economics, uh, everything. Uh, and we would have eight hours nonstop every single day, which made me, that's the reason why I don't do accounting today and I cannot stand it. And maybe thank God that that happened because I would probably, my life would probably suck right now sitting in an office somewhere doing other people's numbers. While in reality, I don't even do my own now. All right. And, uh, I all my stuff selling on on online in any country I have to have somebody else do them for me because I cannot stand to do I mean if something's wrong I'll go and double check it myself but uh yeah I I don't I don't do it anymore So you went to college and that that's interesting it's it's different than uh I guess it may be different than the United States um so you, so you went to college, you started studying this. Um, did you stay there for the full two years? Yes, I actually, I actually did it for four, Ben, because I, I failed two years. And during, I, like I said, I, I wasn't uh, too interested in the studies at the time. And this was after, it was like, basically, it, you start after grade 10 and then go to grade 12 and then there's two more years and I ended up uh, this time I ended up doing an extra uh, extra two years because I failed twice and or sorry I failed once and then they gave us the option at that in that year I can't remember what year it was but there was a night shift where you could actually if you wanted to start working during the day for older people that wanted to go back to school, they gave that option. They would start classes at night. And I figured, well, I want to be up all night. That's what I'm going to do. And I enrolled again, but I wasn't going to school to, to take classes. I was just going there to meet everybody and, and you know, be the cool idiot I was. So I, I failed twice. So then at what point did you start selling the pictures on eBay? How, when, when did those chronologies really uh, overlap? So this was slightly before, after this. As soon as I finished, I actually got myself a, um, a fast food a restaurant. And um, I bought it or, sorry, let me correct this so, so I have the story right. My parents bought it for me. Right. I had nothing saved. I couldn't afford it. Right. And um, so th they bought it for me and hoping that it, it would teach me the lesson of working there and all that stuff. And it kind of did. So I started running it and I had employees working for me there. But what ended up happening was that at the end of the day, and this was, for example, restaurants, and in Europe would have a license all the way till midnight. And then at midnight, you would start stop serving food and you could be there until 2 a.m. there, you know, clean up and stuff. And I would have people show up at midnight just to hang out with me. And we would close the doors and we would stay there later and everything was free uh, at that time. And then we would go to clubs and all that in everything I made and at the time I was making a decent amount of money for for the year it was and for the country I was in it was actually an insane amount of money but I would spend it all every single night uh, and the next morning I would have no money to to open the till again you know for people's change and at the same time I would have terrible headaches from uh, hangovers uh, so it it did teach me a few lessons there of what not to do, but I also learned a lot of what to do because there was a lot of people that uh, actually loved going there over and over every single day. And I, I wasn't a cook, but um, I consider myself pretty good because I learned a lot as well. And I had the top chef in the area 
kind of that's what attracted a lot of people too. And she was uh, she was a great chef, but super bossy. She became my boss, and I owned the business. So, kind of that's how I started. Was my first business was was this fast food restaurant, and then I ended up selling it. And I figured uh, it would be easier for me to not have all the responsibilities and start working for somebody else, which I did. And I did, I worked with fitness equipment. We were like a manufacturer of fitness equipment. It was a Spanish company, but over in Portugal. And I was the um, technical assistant. I would do assistance for the whole country and I was the only one. So I got to travel the entire country every single day, everything paid for. And I, I, you know, I stayed there for a few years because I really loved it. It was, you know, super easy. I enjoyed it and travel every single day. And I was not stuck to, you know, I wasn't married, didn't have any kids, nothing. So I could just go travel the entire country. Then when I was working at Chrysler, that was another job I got after that. And that's when I found that store because I, I, still, I still smoked at the time, like I said, and I would go outside to have the smokes. And that's when I would see that store with the wooden statues. So this is around 97 or so, 1996, 97. eBay was just brand new, right? Uh, I guess a few months old or less than a year old. And I still have that eBay account, by the way. But that, that's when it started. And it was never full-time, right? I still, I still had my, uh, my job until for another few, few years, until uh, that Chrysler closed in, in the city where I was. And um, that's kind of where my, my 9 to 5 ended there for, for another few years. So you started selling on eBay. And it started working, but you started to have some troubles because they were handmade goods and it was still really, really young, the whole internet, uh, gr the, the growth of the internet. Um, how did you then make the transition to more scalable items? Like what did that actionably look like? So that was one of the few times that I had put some, some thought into it, uh, that, those those wooden statues although they were super cool they, it wasn't scalable so i did, started thinking what other products could i um sell and the the were scalable so i needed to do basically what today is called wholesaling which i didn't think i could create my own products and like private label was nothing that i could ever hear of but back then I don't even think YouTube was created yet. So, you know, there was no guru I could follow to get tips and tricks. There was no podcasts. I mean, this, we're so privileged right now. Anything you want to know, you, you, there's a YouTube video, there's a podcast like this one where you can learn things. And I had nothing, so I had to try everything myself. And I started... I started looking for things in whatever websites that I could, but mostly I was trying to focus because like the internet wasn't the huge thing it's today. And I was trying to look locally. What can I get locally at wholesale price or big wholesale lots so I could list them and, and do that. And cell phones started coming out at the time is where the smartphones start coming out and everything was like everybody needed to have one or two. And I start dealing with uh, cell phone cases and that's kind of where it took off in volume, not really in, in dollar amount because um, it was still um, Chinese cell phone cases. So it, they were never worth too much and I didn't have too much money to, to really invest in it and, you know, or the experience and, you know. So the cell phone cases actually started selling really quickly. It's something that would sell lots per day while the statues would sell, you know, one per day 
not every day, you know, uh, once a week, two, and then, you know, start growing from there a couple times a week and then to a couple times a day. While the cell phone cases, as soon as I put them there, they start selling a few every single day. And although profits were low and I had to ship every single one myself, that was, you know, uh, the painful part, doing everything by myself and shipping everything myself eBay didn't have uh, all the software that we have today that would actually tell you the fees uh, ahead of time, how much it's going to cost you to ship. And I was shipping to the USA. So when, every time I shipped something, I would have to guess what the shipping cost would be to charge them. So I had to, you know, 2X, 3X, 4X the price of the product in, in order to have the shipping there. And a lot of times I, I would, you know, go to the post office with my box here, ship this, and I would get a surprise. Like, okay, that's a lot more than I charge for. So it would break even some some item. And, but it gave me the idea that there are a lot of things that are super scalable and very, very big demand, which was cell phone cases at the time. So I started doing that and uh, for the longest time and then I would sell them in person as well and you know pocket bikes and I started changing uh, my products to buy bigger more expensive items which for example those pocket bikes they they were a big bulky item and heavy so they would have to come from China in sea cans and uh, the first one when I ordered it I was so so worried uh, that I would have to keep all of them right and i just i know i thought it was i was buying items that i thought were cool not i didn't know what the, the demand was and that's the wrong way to do it i know that today but so anyway that the first one i got it wasn't a full sea can it was just a partial sea can and the day i got it i sold every single one in person i didn't even list them online I saw them in person. They were, um, you know, uh, the first one sold, the second one sold, and then that person told another person, and they were very good price for them compared to the ones that were available locally, uh, almost half the price. But I was already m making three times the amount um, from what I bought it from. And it gave me kind of the the sign that, okay, this is it. This stuff actually does work. And I wasn't even dealing with Alibaba at the time. Like all my first orders, they were coming from DH gate and all, and DH gate is actually very well known now and, and trustworthy, but there's a lot of other sites that um, were just anything I could find. But DH gate ended up becoming one of the big ones. And then today, of course, Alibaba is the the most used one, trustworthy because you can have Alipay and all that stuff, and your money is somewhat safe, right? Um, yeah. So, and but I never branded anything until 2015. It was always the way it was manufactured by whoever made it. Uh, those cell phone cases I was selling. Uh, well, uh, the, my best seller was a knockoff. It was Head Artie. I don't even know if they're still around or not. Or not. But Head Artie at the time was like so big. And this was actually in um, 2000 something or, you know, 2000, I don't know, six, seven, when they were that big and they were selling huge. Um, but they were not official. And so that kind of ended there without even getting any C services, nothing like that. But in 2015, I decided I, I didn't decide to create my own private label. I, I wanted to start a coffee company because I knew there was a few things out there that are the best money makers in the world. like oil, gold, coffee, uh, you know, the, all those are like top money makers and i figured why don't i start my own coffee company but you know how can i do that and i figured without following 
without even knowing at the time the, the word private label, I created my own by getting a bunch of different organizations together, which was the coffee producer in Vietnam and the laboratory where I wanted to mix it and, and, and roast it. Uh, the laboratory to save me money, I, I couldn't have it in the US. So it, the lab was in China, which ended up causing a bit of trouble because the coffee would have to be shipped from Vietnam to China so the lab could work on it there. But now those labs, you know, to have a food product made in China, although it wasn't produced there, is it doesn't give people must, uh, lots of trust and it wouldn't give me either. But anyway, that's how I discovered the private label world by uh, that attempt there. And by trying to learn more about this private label thing that uh, I didn't know the, the correct term for, that's when I start doing a uh, following now people that in 2015 were available on YouTube, internet, podcasts, all of that. And that's where I found out that I, I can really private label anything, anything I can think of literally, you know, I, I can private label a book. I can private label a kitchen cabinet manufacturer, which I did, you know. And basically, the coffee company is no longer, but everything else since that point, that's when I started with Amazon 2015. And I realized that a lot of the last few years on eBay were wasting my time because a lot of Chinese competitors came in. They, they deliver in 60 days. You know, the 30 days is actually very quick if you buy the, those the, the products directly from China. But I, I couldn't compete by having a, a $12 product. And that's basically a, a really low price for, for anything because of uh, fees and stuff. So I, today I don't sell anything at a price of below uh, sixteen dollars or fifteen ninety nine that's the lowest so always up from that because of uh, fees um and and there's a lot of chinese sellers that are selling direct from china on ebay and if they sell the exact same thing for 3.99 i cannot compete with that so i'm wasting time wasting stock and inventory and plus uh, on ebay you would have to get a, I don't ship myself, of course, anymore, but uh, you need to have a third party fulfillment center while Amazon had everything. You, all you had to do was sign in, give them $39.99 per month to have a professional account. They have a, the advertising platform is built in, the pay per click, display ads, sponsored ads, everything built in. All you have to do is create your own amazing listing make it look really good and they would ship it for me they would warehouse it for me i'm like this is a dream come true right so you didn't need to pay all these people to be shipping the orders for you and for third party fulfillment and warehouses so i didn't need anything and so that was it my bet was on amazon right away and you know it, it paid off it was just I felt like something heavy was removed from on top of me just from the process. Now all I had to do is find products with huge demand and then get more and more of those and put them on the platform. Make sure, of course, there's a lot of tips and tricks on how to get to the top page of Amazon. And of course, you have to do that so you can get the organic uh, searches, and that's how you make the, the big box. And now all I have to do is get more and more products and build brands, basically, which is another thing that I wasn't doing at first, right? It was just random products, uh, no name products, um, throw them out there. As long as it's selling, I would keep rebuying and selling more. While nowadays I still have what I call the everything brand where I have a bit of everything that I already had. If it's still selling, it's in that brand. And then of course you can get permission from Amazon to have several accounts 
if you have um, in the States, for example, if you have an LLC, if you have a corporation in Canada, you can give them those, uh, you know, that different bank account and all that. I have never another account where you create brands and now the brand is something more sellable in the future. I mean, if I want to exit somebody and I want to sell the brand, now that's very more, it's a lot more easy to sell and has a bigger multiplier than the brand I had with, you know, the no name, everything. So it seems like you've made this transition from doing everything yourself and, you know, putting together all the different pieces and getting the laboratory and the product and the supplies and the distributor and everything. And now it seems like the process is more streamlined to where you want to find really strong manufacturers to work with who will private label for you and you're assessing demand in the marketplace. Then you build a brand and either you add the, add those products to an existing brand or create a new brand and then you just sell it and sell as much of it as you possibly can. Is that kind of an accurate, uh, accurate statement? 100%. So for the everything brand, the brand that has a bit of everything from, you know, I, I don't, I don't touch uh, food products anymore uh, of, of my own private label stuff. I don't, I don't deal with that. And just to avoid a bunch of headaches and stuff. Uh, but the everything brand, what I do is I source according to demand it is not what I like. I don't sell what I like. I sell what has demand. If something has a huge demand, I find that product, I find a manufacturer for that product. I put my own label on it, which is, is not just a logo. I don't just stamp a logo on it. Of course, private labeling, uh, the easy definition is just that, right? Where you find a product, you put your logo, on, your label on it, and now it's your own private label. But in reality, there's a lot more to it if you wanna differentiate yourself and make it unique. Uh, there's a lot of things I can do to a product to make it better uh, by, for example, downloading a few thousand reviews from your competitor that also sells that. Download their reviews, find out on those, let's say, for example, there's 5,000 reviews, find out what the most common words are in those 5,000 reviews, and then see what people ask for and see if it's possible to to do that change and make those products better. And I also try to make external packaging that a lot of people at the beginning, uh, now it's there, it's gotten better, but at the beginning people were selling on Amazon on just plastic bags. And I try to get a packaging, a cardboard packaging that can, with an awesome design that that is shelf ready. So if, I have the opportunity to get product X into the shelves at Walmart. Um, it's ready. I don't have to go and design it again. So it's all ready. You know, it has the, the barcode. It has all that, not just the, the FNSQ, which is the barcode for Amazon. It's called the FNSKU. So I have everything ready for the shelves. And that's by demand on the everything brand. When, when it comes to a branded product, it goes by category. So here, I can't really go by, um, it is by demand as well, but it's not really the same way as uh, if I were to find a Bluetooth speaker. Okay, everybody's buying Bluetooth speakers. So cr let's create this. If, if I have a brand of, uh, say, kitchen products, I cannot create now Bluetooth speakers. So the demand is more relative to something that goes inside a kitchen. And that's just an example, right? Okay, and silicone spatula and like Scott says, the garlic press. And, you know, I would, I have to be within those things, but, but always supporting my previous items that already exist inside that category. And of course, there's tools today that can do everything. Demand, they will tell me what the demand is for everything, how much money is being generated per month inside that category in that particular product uh, i can see who all my competitors are what my competitors keywords are i can you know there's today it's so easy if if you really want to 
hustle and do things. It's so easy to to do almost anything. I'm just it's just compared to before, Ben, like in, in the nineties, it's just so so incredible. If if you had a you you're very young, so uh were you born in the nineties already? Yeah, yeah, I'm twenty four, so I was born in nineteen ninety four. Okay, yeah, so but you're still pretty young in the and you were yeah we were three in 97 when i started selling online it was everything was so limited so it gives me today an appreciation for what we have and how easy things really are right there was no chance no chance in in hell that in 1997 or anywhere in the 90s that you could create a podcast get a you know three or four hundred bucks spend on a microphone and put a laptop in front of you in the whole world can listen to you. There was no chance, right? Now it's it just became so easy, and I, I'm really uh, appreciative of that. Me too, because now we get to have this conversation. So it's uh, def I'm definitely very appreciative of it too. You you mentioned how you expanded to Amazon, and then I believe you said you also do a little bit with Shopify and you have your own funnels. Can you talk a, a little bit about that and how you expanded into that? Yeah, so I do have Shopify stores and I have, I have lots of WordPress um, sites, which basically are, are blogs, but they're their sites. And this is for each product for my everything brand. Each product has his own, let's say, his own Facebook page. I have his own WordPress blog. This is just for an extra X, uh, SEO to get some indexing in Google as well because every sell is, is welcome, right? doesn't matter if it's on Amazon, uh, Shopify stores. There's a lot of certain products that, for example, I can't sell knives on um, Amazon Canada. I'm not allowed. Uh, if they're self-assisted. So, for example, I have Shopify sites for that, for those. While in the States, you can pretty much sell uh, anything. Um, but I do have lots of Shopify sites that I already had, um, like prior. Uh, my WordPress blog, I have ClickFunnels. Uh, funnels, and I, I mentioned ClickFunnels, but it could be any kind of funnels because I have others that are not, uh, I don't use ClickFunnels for. But... The reason why I do this is because Amazon is my number one platform right now where the majority, probably 80, 90% of the revenue is coming from. But I need to have a backup plan uh, outside of Amazon for whenever something happens, right? So uh, not only that, but I, outside of Amazon, I control my brand. I control my customer while on amazon even though people are buying from me they're not my customers i don't have their information right um amazon does not give me access to the, uh, somebody's email i can contact somebody within amazon using amazon's email system where the email is not shown to me and i am limited to how many times i can contact them i actually if somebody does not buy from me I cannot contact them, right? So if you buy something from me, I can I can send you a message regarding that sale and that product, and that's it. And of course, I'm going to ask you for feedback, and and that and that um, is pretty much it, uh, right? You cannot do up sales, side sales, any kind of sales uh, to those customers. While well, outside of Amazon, I can. So I create those just to have my my backup plan. And at the same time, Amazon loves external traffic. So if you can give Amazon external traffic, they're going to benefit you for that. But uh, this is, I don't know if I can get a bit more technical. Please, but, please do. Okay, so Amazon, just like any other uh, platform like in social media, the algorithms pretty much work the same. The number one most important thing for algorithms today is relevancy and relevancy comes from engagement on amazon the engagement are sales right there's no comments no likes anything so sales are engagement 
and that gives relevancy to each keyword. So the relevancy doesn't come to the product itself. The relevancy is from a keyword related to that product. So if I send random traffic from Facebook, for example, if I create Facebook ads and send random traffic to my Amazon listing, Amazon will benefit me because there's a lot of external traffic coming to me, but at the same time, I'm hurting myself because they're not going to convert. There are people that are not going there to search for, for my Bluetooth speaker, right? They were just sent there because they saw a Facebook ad that looked cool and they clicked on it. But at the end, they, if they buy something, it's going to be something else that they really care for, not that product that took them there. So I need to, when I send traffic to Amazon, I need to make sure that they're going to convert. And that may seem a little bit impossible, but there's ways to make sure that if you land on my listing from my Facebook ad, that you are going to convert. And this is by screening you through my funnel first. So you go through my funnel first. Doesn't matter what software it is, if it's click funnels or anything else. But when you land on my funnel, now I can capture your information. I can pixel you to retarget you with my Facebook ads at, another, at a later date. But at the same time, the link that I send you to on Amazon, because I'm gonna offer you a discount, big enough that it, you are for sure going to buy, okay? So, uh, and, and a big point here is, when I give somebody a big discount, like say, if you land on my funnel, you're gonna get a big discount, I will never ask you for a review, okay? Because uh, this goes against Amazon's terms of service. When somebody has a big discount or a free product, now they've been incentivized and you don't want that. So I make sure that these people are not going in through my email campaigns where I'm gonna ask for a review. I'm actually telling you I don't need a review, okay? Just, just to make sure that there's nothing uh, no strikes against my account. But by doing this, these people uh, are now, have a big um, relevant, create a big relevancy to whatever keyword that I assign to you. Because on my URL that I give you, there's gonna be keywords built in there. So it's gonna look like you search for Bluetooth speaker the second before you found my product. And now when you convert, because you're getting that, uh, that bigger discount, when you convert, I become super relevant for that product. And then there's another trick with Amazon's algorithm at the last time I checked, and, and this is something that, depending on when people are listening to us, it can change, right? Because in the internet, things change overnight. But the last time I checked, Amazon's algorithm tracked, if somebody adds two, Bluetooth speakers to the cart and buys two of them, that was one visit and two conversions. So basically, in that case, I had 200% conversion rate. That's how it's, it's happening as far as I know until, until now. So what I can do is I tell people, I give them the buy one, get one. It's, that's the name of the deal. So if you buy one now, you get a second one for free, or you get a second one at 50% off, while the first one was at 50% off already, right? So technically, you're getting one for free, but you're paying 50% for each. If, when that happens, you're going to add two to your cart. You're going to check out with two of them, and now my conversion rate has gone through the roof. So my indexing is going to be really good. My relevancy which in Facebook is called the relevancy score. On Amazon, there's no such term, but it is the exact same thing. It's a relevancy score. That relevancy score mixed with sales velocity, how fast I can sell the product, is what's gonna tell your algorithm to put this listing on the very first page. And now you get organic traffic, so you get more sales. The more sales you get, the more you get to the top, so it's kind of a snowball effect, right? And, and the only reason, uh, I mean, there's more reasons, but the main reason you could lose your first page position is if you run out of stock 
or if that product is no longer profitable because that happens too. If I'm selling something for, let's say, the last two years at an insane rate, there's a lot of people that are going to do exact same process as I do, and they're going to find my product, and they're going to copy my product, and they're going to become a competitor. And because a lot of people don't even know what all the fees are, some people are going to sell it cheaper. And even, even though they don't know it yet, but they may be losing money. So I can't lower mine so much because it's either profitable at this rate, which is at today's date, uh, my 2018 was an average of 22% margin after everything paid, right? That's the um, absolute profit in my pocket. Although it doesn't go in the pocket, it goes back into the business. But um, th that kind of stuff will can kill one of my products, right? When the margins start going down and down and down, my money is better off spent on something else more profitable. So I can easily kill a product because uh, I'm not in love with the product, right? Uh, it's it's just uh, it's just business. So I I feel for a lot of people that are in love with an idea or a product and they put everything into that product, but they're the only person that actually cares for that. And then uh, a lot of people contact me because I have a podcast about Amazon as well. And they contact me and say, you know, nobody's buying this. And I really, it's because there's no demand for that. You are in love with that product. And a lot of people will, will do everything to save their product. Like if it was a child, but it's worth it's not worth it right if if there's no sales there's no demand nobody else wants it you kill that product you use your money you try to lose as as um, minimum as possible and put that money somewhere else that's going to make you money and that's what i do that was awesome by the way and to everybody who's listening i would highly encourage you to go back and actually listen a couple times to what Quinn was saying because there were a lot of gems there and there were a lot of layers of gems there. So you might need to listen a couple times to really pick through all of that value. Those were some serious value bombs, by the way. So thank you for that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned a lot of very technical things that you do like retargeting, pixeling, um, you mentioned emailing specific customers, some who do one thing and some who do another you know, you're working very closely with the Amazon algorithm, you're doing discounts, you're vetting with the fun, like you're doing a lot of things on a lot of, on a lot of platforms, you know, with Facebook pages and Shopify and click funnels and Amazon. How hands on are you in your business right now? I mean, do you have like a big team or are you doing it all yourself? What is, what does that look like? Uh, that's, that's a great question, Ben. I'm, I'm very hands on. Okay. <clears throat> so, I've read the four hour work week like every other entrepreneur, but I agree with everything about, about the idea of it, but I don't do four hour work weeks myself, right? I work, uh, I could do 16 hours per day because I don't consider this work. I really, really love this. I do this. This is my hobby. When somebody else can go, okay, I want to go fishing today. I want to do this. I want to do this, but I don't do everything because with time and age, I, I realized that there's a lot of people a lot younger than me that in no time can learn faster than me and know how to do things better than me. So if it's not my specialty, I can get somebody else to do it. And there's other things that um, is not, there's not much, training required like for example customer service answering emails uh, as long as i have a lot of templates done the throughout the years certain templates can answer almost any question that somebody's going to ask you and every issue almost so i do have a va to control that area right and then if there's something that they cannot manage you come directly to me um and then i can log into everything and take care of it from there but 
I have a team, it's me and two more remote. I don't have any, any help in person with me. So everything is done remote. And then I have a lot of software that helps me automate my stuff. So, uh, what else, what else was it been? Uh, I don't want to get lost here. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about the things that you do every day. Like where does your time actually go? Okay. So most of the time, like any other entrepreneur today, I, I'm guessing, I don't want to say any other because there's a lot of people that are listening that are probably thinking, you know, I can, I have perfect focus and I do a lot of things, but I get lost a lot of the times. Okay. So I want to do a lot of everything. And I, I ended up doing a uh, tiny bits of everything instead of doing a lot of it because I have a few uh, tabs open on the computer and I start doing this and, you know, uh, having lots of, uh, for example, Facebook pages and stuff. I use Facebook more for business than to, I don't go there to check the cat videos and that stuff anymore. And I try never to, to use social media for that only for, you know, business uh, purposes. So, um, I, I still get lost like anybody there. There's things that can, uh, they're designed to capture your, your attention and, and they often work, but I tend to, I try a lot. I get, I have apps like the Pomodoro app that, uh, tries to uh, give me focus. And I don't know if you heard about that one. So yeah. Every yeah, the, the Pomodoro technique where you work like a certain amount of time and then you take a little break. Yeah, that's right. So I have, I have an app installed on the phone. I have an app installed on the computer and I work 25 minutes straight on one thing with absolute focus on that thing. And then it forces me, it doesn't force me, but it tells me you have to take a five minute break. So in that five minute break, you do something different. So whatever you want to do, you have to do something different in those five minutes. And then it's going to start counting another 25 when you focus on the previous task until it's finished or the next task. And I try these things, but the majority of my time is, is spent um, in the business or in other people's businesses as well, because I, I also manage a couple other Amazon seller accounts, right? So I can go in their accounts and I can see um, what's happening. For example, my VAs also answer their customer support and things that happen. There's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that can happen really quick inside the Amazon platform. So I'm always checking out for those, which is um, at any time a listing can be shut down for it could be a false positive or it could be that somebody reported something or um you know just uh two days ago there was one listing that was that was shut down and i i checked on it right away and because they emailed me immediately and i checked on it and basically it was the issue was on our end it was not amazon's issue it was not a wrong there's wrong customer um um, I guess customers that complain about certain things, right? And sometimes it's your competitor that does it on purpose, but this one wasn't, it was legit. And it was the, the third party warehouse because Amazon has now bigger, uh, and store long-term storage fees and storage fees. So the, this warehousing company, had shipped the wrong SKU, which is each unit has its own SKU. And it has shipped the, the unit uh, was supposed to be a bundle of two and it shipped the units. There were only one. So everybody started complaining and this was, um, you know, it would sell a few, a few dozen times per day. So just if two days go by now you're, there's 30, 40 orders out there that were shipped with the wrong quantity and so amazon canceled the listing and it's temporary so i can reactivate it the second that my inventory is cleared so that kind of stuff for example i went in myself i removed every bit of inventory 
ship it back to the warehouse. Meanwhile, send a new order to Amazon and, it's, and I have the listing closed still. And as soon as that order arrives that day, I'll turn a listing back on. Hopefully I can keep all my momentum and you know, uh, that, that kind of stuff. So I'm always looking for the emergencies. And at the same time, uh, I love doing keyword research. I love doing product research. I'm always looking for products. Even if I'm out in the store, I walk to in the store when I go grocery shopping, I take longer than my wife because there are certain products that I, oh my God, what is, look at this. I check out the packaging and I take pictures. How cool is this? And I, it's just really, I really like, love it. So I do it every chance I can and a bit of everything. I, I do my own funnels. I design my Shopify stores. There's certain things when it comes to more technical because I don't, I'm not a programmer. That kind of stuff also goes out. Uh, I do a lot of um, temporary subcontracting, you know, um, stuff like Upwork and FreeUp, um, um, which are uh, FreeUp is, is a great site where everybody's already trained for, for each niche. So, Basically, whatever I know how to do, I try to do it. And I, I, I know now it's better to, to have somebody whose time is better spent doing that. So I, I still have an issue with letting go of control. So uh, I try my best, but I'm still involved in, in little things too, just because I really like it. So maybe you could talk about right now, you know, cause it seems like you've been selling now on Amazon and you really hit your stride for a couple of years. Like, can you take a second to really brag and talk about like how big have you really grown it? So numbers, uh, although numbers are, are a decent amount, uh, the numbers don't really always tell the true story. Okay, there's a lot of people that I know that make eight figures on Amazon. I have a friend that does 80 million per year on Amazon. But the numbers don't really tell the whole story, right? Margins and profit is what really matters. So, of course, I'm not in the 80 million. I am not in the eight figure, uh, right? But I expect to be in 2020 at the eight figure. But what really matters is the the profit margins of what you make, or, you know, uh, but my buddy that I told you that made 80 million uh, in 2018, only four were profit. Although four million profit is beautiful, right? You cannot complain having four million profit, but that's four million out of 80. Okay, so his margins were very, very small. So he's dealing with volume. I want to, of course, deal with volume as well, but if I can sell one unit and make $10 profit, Instead of selling two units and make $10, $10 profit, I'd rather sell that one unit, okay? So I, I, want to, I want to have bigger profits, which causes less issues because if, if you sell, uh, let's say if you sell 3,000 units of something per month, you're gonna have certain issues, you're gonna have a certain amount of defects, returns, and all that stuff. Instead of selling 3,000 per month. If you're selling 30,000 of that, those units and you're making the exact same amount of money, your problems are gonna be a lot bigger than mine. So I tend to focus on profit number one and then grow it from there uh, as far as I can, right? Because every, every product and niche has a cap. So I try to reach uh, that cap and keep an eye out to when I get there. Says, um, I didn't know about caps and I got to one point where, you know, if you're throwing in five bucks of advertising, you're getting $10 back out of it. You keep throwing in for five and five and five and five. But it got to a point where you can reach your market cap if you have a small niche, or if you have a little uh, or a sub niche, right? And if you reach your cap, the more money you throw in, the more you're wasting because there's no more, there's nobody else that you can reach outside. So everybody else that you go and reach besides those people, 
are not interested. So they're not going to be relevant. So they're kind of going to, not only they're going to waste my money, they're going to waste my indexing and bring me down. And I found out in, in that in one product too. So when it comes to bragging, uh, my number one brag is that I am, I have profit on every product, right? And uh, although, although I'm not in the eight figures yet, uh, what I make, like I said, 22% and it's not perfect, right? There's, there's a lot, a lot higher margins, but this is after paying absolutely everything, all, all advertising on our, all platforms, uh, playing VAs, paying taxes, shipping the product itself, pick and pack fees, which is something that people all often forget on Amazon when selling cheap items, pick and pack fees uh, could be uh, very percentage wise could be very high. So uh, I'm looking to increase those, those margins hopefully be uh, at 30%, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. And I'm trying to reach the eight figures. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we've talked a lot about uh, business and in, in, um, in the years that, that we've covered, we've, we've uh, you know, covered a lot. And I really appreciate you sharing all that. Uh, I think that's awesome. Um, but what else has been going on in your personal life parallel to all of this business success? So I, uh, I'm a father and, um, I had uh, a year, year and a half ago, I had twins as well. So I went from one kid to three really quick and they are, they're lovely. Now they all walk, talk, sing, run, all that stuff. So it's fantastic. But there was one point that they didn't all run and sing and, and, when the twins were born, it was, it was very, very stressful time because, uh, my, my little boy had, um, a couple issues, not nothing, nothing major, but it's, uh, what is it called? Like acid, acid reflux or something. So they, you would cry 24 hours a day. Well, not 24 cause he would sleep sometimes, but he would sleep like uh, 15 minute intervals and it, it was just it took a big a big hit on me and and mom uh or their mom of course not mine but uh everything is uh back to normal he turned out to be a wonderful amazing kid just like any other of course every parent would say that about their kids but we're a happy family i I love my wife. Uh, she's she's fantastic. She's the best mother my kids could have found, and um, she supports me in what I do, of course. And I support her. She's uh, she's becoming a somewhat of a Instagram influencer in the uh, vegan community and plant based. And she has a couple a couple plant based pages, and. And that's it. We're, we we have lots of snow outside, so our winters are very, very, um, very cold. Let's let's just put it that way. Minus forty, which equals minus forty Fahrenheit. It's the exact same. That's where the scales meet. Minus forty is very normal for a winter here. So we don't do many activities outside. Let's just put it that way. So. Downstairs, I have a huge basement where I put basketball court in there, and I had um, up until recently uh, a pool table and stuff. I removed the pool table, and now there's a huge area where we can go play and do activities. And there's houses and quads where the kids run around. So I I am a family man now, and uh, that's the reason why I, I love doing this business because I can do it from anywhere in the world as long as my laptop has internet and I can always be around them, right? And watch them grow instead of having uh, a nanny raise them for me. Uh, I'm always there or not always. Cause like I said, just before the interview, I just landed from, from a trip. Cause uh, I, uh, 
I travel often, but I come home every chance I get. So we, you know, we've talked a ton about Amazon and, and, you know, the, the product side and and your business. Um, But you also mentioned that you have a podcast. So can you talk a little bit about that and how you grew it and some of the things that you're doing on that side? Yeah, for sure. I actually have two podcasts. One of them is a commerce related podcast. It's the QA selling online. And um, that's of course everywhere that, that you can think of like where all podcasts are. And then I also host the fail fast podcast and the fail fast podcast is about entrepreneurial failure. So, uh, I interview a lot of successful entrepreneurs that are not afraid to tell us their story of how they started by failing. And normally anybody that takes a lot amount of action will fail a lot of times. So I I bet that every successful person that you can find had failed at one point because that's the way that you find your success, right? Is one, one failure after the other one. And because I failed so many times too, I decided I started that podcast. That one is is less than a year old, uh, while the other one is going cl- close to 300 episodes now, the QA selling online. And it's um, QA. A lot of people take it for questions and answers. It is for questions and answers as, w- as well as Queen of Morm, right? QA. And yeah, that one has... Uh, last time I checked, about 60,000, 62,000 uh, downloads per month. And uh, yeah, I mean, I get I get a ton of love from that podcast that people message me, uh, thanking me for, for the tips and a lot of people that started selling uh, and, and they want to let me know how they're doing now. And that really gets me going. I really love... When somebody messaged me on, doesn't matter if it's on Instagram, on Twitter, and when people message me and, and and thank me or just let me know what they're doing because of they what they heard on the podcast, if it's from me or from a guest, what, what they heard, that's such an amazing feeling that gets me going because my QA selling online podcast, although I have 300 episodes, I've been offered five figures to advertise on the podcast. I turned down every single one so far. I want that podcast to be completely unbiased. So there is no sponsors. I do not promote any tools and I don't even have affiliate links. So if I mention a tool that I use on that podcast, it's because I actually use it and I'll never make a cent from it. So here you go. This is a tool I use. And, and I, because I, I want people to know that I'm not selling a course. I don't have the podcast because I'm not selling a course and I'm not selling tools or software, right? It's I'm actually just giving the content, right? And that's why I get a lot of, a lot of love from that one. As for the fail fast podcast, no, any, any sponsors are welcome. And uh, I will have on that one because that's just regular interviews with podcasters and, you know, it's storytelling. So Quinn, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing everything that you have. It's, it's truly been a, been a pleasure for me and, and I hope it has been for you as well. Um, I have a, a, a few more questions for you and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Absolutely, Ben. All right. So one of the things that I'm obsessed with, right, is connection connection between you and I as guest to host, as friends, connection between you and the audience, me and the audience, the audience members with each other. Um, I'm obsessed with it, right? And, and I'm always trying to figure out how do you build better, deeper, more meningful, more genuine human connection? So I want to ask you, what is your philosophy on building genuine, deep, and meaningful human connection? Well, I think the most important one, and I guess you'll agree with me, is the in-person connection. And although 
my time is a little bit limited and I try to schedule everything. I meet lots of people that if they are local people that, um, that want to meet with me and I have never charged anybody for my time. I go for coffee with a lot of people that I don't know or didn't know because I get to know them. And when you're sitting down and actually sitting in front of somebody, having coffee with them, talking about e-commerce and launching products, and it actually gets, it builds a really quick connection, okay? Then I also attend lots of meetups, and I've been uh, speaking at meetups, and that also it gives a big connection, right? And then, of course, there's the webinars, Facebook groups, podcasts like this, where you, you end up building a connection. Of course, it's not that quick, but you can still build very powerful connections. And I have done so just from people that you meet, let's say on a Facebook group, and you say something that they agree with or they liked or the same way they say something. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that was very smart. So we can end up talking on, you know, uh, DMs or Messenger. And then you can build up, build up a connection like that. And to be completely honest, I've had, I have two different um, businesses that I partnered with people that I met through or one of them through the podcast. And one of them through Facebook, right? And we partnered in things that are online businesses. Uh, yeah, so I agree, Ben. Networking and meeting people, masterminds is mastermind is you know, if you read Think and Grow Rich, you know, the power of mastermind is what built the iron industry. And I I really believe in that. I'm very very strong beliefs in that. What is your greatest theory? Ooh, okay. Greatest theory. I don't know. I have something that's pretty brand new to me. And coming again, like thinking grow rich and the, the secret and law of attraction, that kind of thing. That's very new to me. It's something that only in the last couple of years I've been, uh, I've been really thinking more of because up until then or up until now, I was very skeptical of everything. I'm a science guy. So if I cannot see something, if I cannot hold something in my hand, it doesn't exist or it didn't exist. So of course, th there are things that we can't see that are real, just like the law of gravity, right? If I drop the pencil, it's going to fall. I can't see that gravity, but I know it exists. So there's stuff like the law of attraction that lately I'm really getting into. I'm, I'm, I'm loving the fact that I'm, I'm super, super positive now. There's almost nothing. Uh, well, it's hard to say almost nothing, but there's very few things that can get a negative reaction out of me now. Right. And I feel that by being positive and happy with everybody and, Try not to judge. That's very important. Do not judge people because there's always a story that you don't know, no matter what it is. And I feel, I feel better myself now that I become, became this person that I wasn't. I feel better and I would recommend anybody. If you, the best way for you to feel better is to make others feel better. And I, I, I love the new me that years ago I was completely different I, I, I did a lot of judging and it was just ah man it, it's a lot better let's put it that way it's a lot better now Ben I'm trying to think of how to phrase this properly is, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today in other words, what did I miss? Uh, I don't. I don't think you missed anything, Ben. Uh, like that last that last little explanation I did kind of lets you know who, who the new me is. And I did for the longest time. I did a lot of, like I said, a lot of judging, and 
it was not more of judging is that the fact that, for example, in the online community, uh, I've been in e-commerce even before the word e-commerce was spoken out there, right? It was just the internet, selling things on the internet. And so when, when I would see somebody new come in, I would always judge them as they, uh, you have nothing to say or nothing for me to learn. And I changed that because like I told you earlier, a new, a young kid, my kids were born yesterday. That's just a matter of speak, but they can handle iPhone better than me. Right. So I figured that this new generation, they can learn things that are related to computers, electronics, everything so much quicker that I can learn from people that have not been in business 20 years. People that have been in business for, for one year, they can teach me, you know, they can teach me a lot of lessons and I'm ready to listen. So that's who I am today. Uh, the old me would not listen to everybody. And today I do listen to everybody and I can find gold nuggets, things that were completely, were to me were like a default setting, right? Today they're not anymore. Things change super quick and I don't want to be outdated. I don't want to be the old man out there. So I listen to all the young ones that have different experiences than me. And so that's the new me and uh, it's helping me a lot, Ben. So I'm 24, right? I have a couple different businesses, but this show is my, my greatest passion. What question should I be asking you that I just wouldn't think to ask? Hmm, that's a hard one. What you should be asking. You got me, Ben. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what to say, Ben. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we could think of it as if you could give yourself advice when you were younger. Um, maybe, maybe we could frame it that way. Okay. Yeah. So. By framing it that way, I can see it. It's uh, one very important thing is that I could have helped me a lot and it would help anybody that's 24 or 20 is that <clears throat> while there's nothing else stopping you, uh, the, the easiest and way to, to grow your businesses is when you don't have anybody else depending on you. You, so you don't have two or three mortgages. You don't, you don't have many or anybody depending on you. Uh, I don't know if that's the case or not, but you are very mobile when you don't have a family with you. For example, right now, I, it's five of us. So I could, years ago, I could go to Mexico, sit on the beach. If I had internet connection, I could run my business from there and stay there for six months. I cannot do that now. So my advice is if you can do that right now, enjoy it right now. And because when you do have your own family, uh, there's different things, your priorities change and you will still enjoy it because you're going to love spending time with your kids and everything, but your priorities are going to be different. So uh, I would also advise myself to give up the party. I, I partied a lot, maybe too much. I partied enough for a few lifetimes, Ben. And that was, um, I mean, I had a ton of fun. But business-wise, in my savings, were they were not very happy with me because there was no savings. There was nothing. It was just enough money to party tomorrow. And that's kind of what got me into this, you know, started selling to make an extra bit of cash. So... My advice is live your life, but remember there's also a future. So don't live everything. Uh, don't live everything today. Live it today, thinking that there's a tomorrow, and build something for that tomorrow. Quinn, that was awesome, man, and thank you again so so much for coming on the show. It has truly been a pleasure, 
And uh, to everybody who's listening, I want to thank y'all. Uh, my voice just cracked a little bit there, but I want to thank y'all very much. And uh, I love you guys. And thank you so much for supporting the show um, and, and for watching and listening. Um, y'all are the best. So thank you very much. You want to wrap us up, Quinn? Thank you for having me, Ben. It's been an amazing time. I love talking to you. Well, stay in touch. Of course, it's going to be another one of those connections that's going to last. And I really appreciate you having me here, Ben. Fantastic. So everybody remember, this has been another episode of the Project Egg Show, where we interview entrepreneurs so that you can build your business, create your dream life, and we can all live in a better world together. Thank you so much and have a fantastic day.